Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. We have the honor of having Tony Goldberg and Sam Sibley with us. They will be teaching us their way of studying epidemiology of infectious disease in veterinary medicine. Tony is a professor in the Department of Pathobiological Sciences in the Veterinary Medicine School at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And Sam Sibley is his bioinformatician in Tony's group. Tony and Sam, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Clotilde, and uh, thank you for arranging this webinar. Again, I'm Tony Goldberg. I'm a professor of epidemiology in the School of Veterinary Medicine at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Sam Sibley is a scientist in my laboratory. And we study the molecular epidemiology of infectious diseases of relevance to veterinary medicine. Um, and we're just starting to get into some next generation sequencing approaches to studying molecular epidemiology uh, so we can offer the perspective of people who are in the process of learning these methods. I want to draw a quick distinction before we get fully started on what we mean by molecular epidemiology. What we're talking about in this case is using DNA and RNA sequences of microbes to infer epidemiological processes. And particularly, we're interested in transmission and evolution. Um, what we're not going to talk about today is the alternative definition of molecular epidemiology that you sometimes see in the human medical literature, which refers to biomarkers and genetic factors that predict disease risk. That's sometimes called genetic epidemiology, but it's a different thing. So if you if you uh, called in to hear about biomarkers and genetic factors, you can uh, sit back a little bit because we're going to be talking about infectious disease transmission and evolution. So a, a brief outline of what we're going to talk about. We're not going to focus on any one disease system. Rather, I've chosen some examples from the work we've done over the past 15 or 20 years that illustrate how molecular epidemiology works in our lab, and that also illustrates some of the advantages and challenges that next generation sequencing approaches present. So for example, we'll start out talking about a virus, a very important virus of pigs, PERS virus, and some of its relatives. We'll talk about the epidemiology of co-infection in general, using uh, humans and primate, non-human primates as examples. We'll talk about the urban ecology of West Nile virus, which is something that my lab has been studying for over 10 years. And then again, we'll try to describe some of the advantages and challenges that next generation sequencing approaches bring to bear for studying these systems. So I want to start out with a virus that I've been studying for my entire career, PERS virus. PERS stands for porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus. It's in the viral family Arteriviridae, so it's an arterivirus. Uh, there are no known human arteriviruses, but these viruses are distantly related to uh, coronaviruses, such as SARS or MERS. Um, the, the reason this is a pathogen of veterinary concern is that it causes reproductive failure in sows and respiratory syndromes and poor growth in young pigs, so it's an economically important virus. You can imagine that if your business is to produce pigs, if your sows are losing their litters, and if you have poor growth in your younger pigs, that's a problem. And the remarkable thing about PERS is that it's one of the few viruses in veterinary medicine, of which I'm aware, where DNA sequencing uh, or uh, RNA sequencing of uh, the virus is a standard diagnostic procedure. So for many years, people have been generating large data sets of open reading frame five sequences from this virus. That op open reading frame codes for the major envelope glycoprotein. So I looked yesterday, and on GenBank, there were over 18,000 PERS virus sequences entered. And about 68% of those, or over 12,000, were comprised of ORF5 sequences. So this is a massive database of a virus in veterinary medicine. And this is done for purposes of viral classification and epidemiologic inference. And as an example of that, here's a very nice study that was published out of Fred Leung's lab in Hong Kong in 2010. 
which tried to make sense of this massive database of PERS virus or five sequences generated using Sanger methods. Um, in this paper, they analyzed over 8,600 sequences. And I don't, what, don't, don't pay attention to the details of this graph, but it just demonstrates the remarkable things you can do with large data sets of viral sequences. This, each of these groups represents a different phylogeographic cluster of the virus, and each of them have different interesting Bayesian phylodynamic trajectories, which indicate something about the population history of that virus. So this type of analysis allows us to do a very careful dissection of the evolutionary history and spread of viruses when we're able to generate sequences of this number. Now, this, is a, this was a combined effort across the world by veterinary diagnostic labs and researchers that's taken decades to amass thousands upon thousands of these sequences. And one thing that this research highlighted, I and I, I mentioned it here on the left, is that the evolutionary rate of this virus is, is really, really fast. That's my little rocket. Uh, th this virus evolves at a rate of between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 2 nucleotide substitutions per site per year, which, if that's an accurate estimate, estimate makes it one of the fastest evolving organisms on Earth. So it's a really fast evolving virus. And for years, people have been interested in why this virus evolves so quickly and what is the underlying level of genetic variation that PERS has. So here's a study from the ancient past out of my laboratory when I was a faculty member at the University of Illinois. We asked the question about quasi-species diversity in PERS virus. This was, this was at the time, a, a, a big analysis, and it's still widely cited. But basically, what we did is we took nine field isolates labeled A1 through B2. Uh, and we, we PCR amplified this diagnostic gene, or 5 and then we cloned, using conventional cloning techniques, uh, the amplicons and sequenced 12 individual clones per isolate to gain some understanding of the diversity of this virus within an individual infection. And each of these vertical lines is proportional to the number of non-synonymous or amino acid change inducing substitutions at each of these sites along the ORF5 gene. And what, what you can see is just that there are a lot of within infection genetic diversity within these isolates, and much more than you see in this control sample, which is from a limiting dilution experiment in the lab. So this is essentially a clonal virus. Th this took a remarkable amount of effort to PCR amplify, clone, and sequence all these viruses to understand quasi-species diversity in just nine field isolates. That was in 2003. But just in, in recent years, people have caught on to the fact that next generation sequencing might be able to offer some insights here. This was a paper published last year that I thought was quite nice because it outlines, it's a review that outlines sort of a, a uh, very reasonable pipeline for how one might apply next generation sequencing methods to this type of question. And, it divides things into a wet lab component and a bioinformatics component, component. And you can see that this is very typical of what would happen in a next-gen sequencing lab. Clinical samples would be extracted for RNA. Uh, libraries would be made. These would be sequenced. And there's a number of steps here to arrive at a consensus sequence. But then, with next-generation sequencing technologies, one can go beyond that and look at single nucleotide polymorphisms, quasi-species diversity, and other things. So, it's clear that people are starting to think about this in veterinary medicine for understanding the basic biology of these important pathogens. And as an example of that, here's another paper out of the Leung lab in Hong Kong that, that created what I thought was a very nice graphic of 16 PERS virus samples from Hong Kong showing here uh, their relationships illustrated by this network. And uh, again, it's not necessary to pay attention to all the fine details, but each of these concentric circles says something about the amount of diversity within an individual infection. So these are, these are 16 pigs. And th this particular study was done with uh, 454 deep sequencing technology. And th the bottom line is about a half a percent to 3 percent of sites in each of these viruses were polymorphic within an individual infection, meaning there's an enormous diversity of haplotypes existing within natural infections 
of pigs with this virus. So we're beginning to see the uptake of these technologies for understanding quasi-species diversity in veterinary pathogens. So I also looked yesterday at how many articles have been published in the medical literature as assayed by PubMed on each of the four known arteriovirus species, uh, PERS virus, equine arteritis virus, lactate dehydrogenase virus, and simian hemorrhagic fever virus. And you can see the literature is dominated by PERS virus. And that's one of the reasons that my collaborators here at Wisconsin at the Primate Center uh, and I have, have delved into the least known of the arteriovirus, simian hemorrhagic fever virus. And when you don't know a lot about viruses going in, this is where next generation techniques can make a big difference. So a few years ago, we began a project with my collaborators Dave O'Connor and Tom Friedrich and their students at the AIDS Vaccine Research Lab here at Wisconsin to understand more about the diversity of the simian arteriviruses, the, the distant relatives of PERS virus that I just talked about. Here's a, a paper, here's a figure from a paper that uh, we published in 2013 led by Michael Locke, now a scientist at Wisconsin in the AIDS Vaccine Research Lab, showing that the simian arteriviruses are very diverse and share a common genomic architecture which links them taxonomically. And we've been uh, studying these viruses for a few years now using both traditional methods, Sanger sequencing, but also deep sequencing methods just because in some ways it's easier when you don't know a lot about the viruses going in. So as an example, here, here's a nice study led by Adam Bailey, a PhD, an MD-PhD student in Dave O'Connor's lab, comparing two simian arteriviruses that we've been studying in the endangered red colobus monkeys of Uganda. And what, what Adam did was to create, using a whole genome sequences generated with Illumina technology, these matrices of genetic similarity between viruses uh, in different hosts. And, and again, the numbers aren't important. It just illustrates that the viruses have clusters of, of uh, sequences that are very similar to each other, as shown here in red, and some other clusters that are not very similar to each other. So they have a high genetic diversity between hosts. And we're trying to understand what this means for transmission in the field. But it was really nice to be able to use deep sequencing technologies to rapidly generate full genome sequences of these viruses when we didn't know much about them going in. Also, a nice thing that, that Adam was able to do was to compare the diversity of these viruses within individual infections. So here he's shown synonymous nucleotide diversity and non-synonymous nucleotide diversity within monkeys. And for reasons we don't understand for this particular pair of viruses, the, the first variant, which we call simian hemorrhagic fever virus from Kibali red colobus 1 versus from the, the second variant of that virus, the first one tends to be more genetically diverse within individual infections, uh, whether you look at synonymous or non-synonymous nucleotide substitutions. Uh, so that, that was a nice, a nice illustration of how you can use deep sequencing data to compare genetic diversity within infection. So why do we have these interesting samples and why are we able to study these interesting viruses in the first place? It has to do with field research that my group has been conducting for over a decade in western Uganda. This is a map. Uh, this black outlined area is an area of exceptional biodiversity called the Albertine Rift. And the little red shape here in the upper right is Kibali National Park a national park that's forested in Uganda where we've been studying primates for many years and there's a long history of primate research there and a very high rate of human population growth. Our project is called the Kibali Eco Health Project and we have a website so please look it up. But we, we have been interested in the natural history and epidemiology of primate infections in this area for many years. I've told you a little bit about the arteriviruses in this population of monkeys, but we've also been interested in other systems where deep sequencing technology has been very informative. One of those is the malaria-like parasites. So we embarked on a study several years ago to understand whether or not the primates in this community have malaria-like parasites and what the transmission patterns of those parasites might be. So in this image, uh, 
taken from a publication by my former uh, DVM student, Mary Thurber, shows that we were able to detect using microscopy the trophozoite and gametocyte forms of these malaria-like parasites in the genus Hepatocystis related to plasmodium that causes human malaria in four species of non-human primate from Kibali National Park, Uganda. So using that information, we were able to use conventional methods, sequencing of the cytochrome B gene in these parasites to conduct molecular phylogenetic studies of the parasites. And what I've shown here are some phylogenetic trees that show the phylogenetic position of each of these, these lineages of hepatocystis in each of our species of primates from Uganda with reference to published reference strains from the literature. And all this is meant to illustrate is that the primates in this one community have a very high diversity of new variants of this parasite lineage. And that, that was interesting in and of itself. But again, I mentioned that molecular epidemiology is often concerned with transmission patterns. So we've been interested in what this means for transmission. And we couldn't quite get at it using these conventional Sanger sequencing-based approaches. So what Mary did in collaboration with uh, George Dennis, who's a very talented PhD student in Tom Friedrich's lab at uh, the Primate Center, was use deep sequencing. In this case, we used 454 technologies uh, several years ago, although we're migrating to Illumin te technologies now for this sort of thing. We uh, deep sequenced within each animal a 420 base pair amplicon from hepatocystis from the cytochrome B gene. And we generated a little less than 1,000 reads per individual uh, on average. And this is a complicated graph, but I want to lead you through it because it shows the value of these methods. Up on the top here, we have a simplified version of that phylogenetic tree I, saw, I showed in the last slide. So we have six lineages of hepatocystis that we've identified in our monkeys from Uganda. And each lineage is characteristic of a particular monkey species. So for example, Lineage A is characteristic of the red colobus, B, the black and white colobus, C, the red tail monkey, D, the red tail monkey, E, the red colobus, and F, the baboon. Now, each row of this figure shows an individual monkey's deep sequence data. So what we did is we deep sequenced and we sorted each monkey's infections into piles that correspond to one of these lineages. So the easiest way is to lead you through, for example, the black and white colobus. If we look at the black and white colobus, not surprisingly, these two black and white colobus individuals have uh, sequences in them that correspond to the black and white colobus lineage. Similarly, the red tail monkeys have either one or the other of the two red tail monkey lineages. But what's really interesting is if you look at the red colobus here and here, some red colobus have one red colobus lineage in them. Some red colobus have the other red colobus lineage in them. But deep sequencing allowed us to identify certain red colobus that have both. So there are some red colobus that are co-infected with both red colobus lineages at once. And we can only detect that through deep sequencing. And one really, really interesting thing we discovered happened in the baboons. If you look, a little over half of the baboons are infected with a single variant that corresponds to the baboon lineage. However, there's about a little less than a half of the baboons that are co-infected. The major variant that is infecting these baboons is the baboon variant, but every once in a while, we see just a little bit of the red colobus variant as a minor variant infecting the baboon. So we never would have guessed that baboons, for some reason that we still don't understand, are being infected with red colobus malaria-like parasites, but they are. And this was an unexpected finding. And again, we could only see this interesting pattern of co-infection with deep sequencing data. Now, co-infection is becoming very important in understanding the epidemiology of both veterinary pathogens and human pathogens. So I just wanted to mention this, another example of co-infection that came out of a recent study uh, of, of another virus prevalent in this area. So this is work that was led uh, by my former student, Rhea Guy, who's now a postdoc at the University of Georgia, and uh, Michael Locke, who I mentioned earlier, who works in the David O'Connor lab at the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center. 
So in Uganda a while ago, we discovered that humans were infected at a fairly high prevalence with a high diversity of human pegiviruses, also known as GB virus C. This was a study we published a few years ago. And this is an interesting virus because we know from the literature that it actually interacts with HIV infection. So if you're a person who has HIV, but you're co-infected with this human pegivirus, GB virus C, it actually delays the progression to AIDS. We don't know exactly why people are studying it. It has something to do with immunomodulation caused by this virus, but it's possible this virus could be a good virus. So we've known this virus was circulating at high rates in people in Uganda and actually around the world. So very cleverly, what uh, David and Michael and our collaborators did was to look at people who were infected with Ebola virus during the recent West African Ebola epidemic. And using deep sequencing data that others had generated, uh, we were able to discover that a lot of the people infected with Ebola were also infected or co-infected with GB virus C. And this graph shows the age distribution of infection for both viruses, which we published just this year. Um, but what's interesting is that there was some evidence, some epidemiologic evidence, that patients infected with GB virus C who are also infected with Ebola virus tended to die at lower rates than people who are not co-infected with GB virus C. Now, there's this is an epidemiological observational study, but it nevertheless raises the possibility that this virus, GB virus C, might be interacting with Ebola virus. Um, that's, that's an open research question, and this is an associational study, but I thought it was a very clever use of deep sequencing data generated by others for other purposes by Dave and, and, and Michael and our, uh, the other co-authors on our paper just again illustrating the utility of deep sequencing information for understanding co-infection and transmission patterns. So I want to switch over now to a system that I've been studying uh, with many collaborators for over 10 years that's a little closer to home. Uh, this is West Nile virus in the city of Chicago. So Chicago was on the leading edge of the West Nile invasion into North America in the early 2000s, 2000s. And in fact, in 2002, the state of Illinois, where Chicago is, led the United States in the number of human West Nile cases. And to this day, Chicago and the surrounding suburbs have remained hotspots of infection for West Nile virus in, in people and birds and mosquitoes. So every year to date, we can, we can go out into the field and see cases of West Nile virus in people and in animals in the Chicago area. This map shows our study site uh, in Chicago. The city of Chicago will be right around here. And you can see, based on this physiographic map, that Chicago lays, lays on a lake plain that's very old, very wet environment, which has many habitats that are suitable for mosquito breeding. And in 2002, when the virus came into Chicago, you can see here in the red dots, the spatial distribution of cases. You can see some interesting clusters here. Our, our study area is focused on this southern cluster near the village of Oak Lawn, but there's a lot of interesting spatial epidemiology going on there that's a focus of my other collaborators around the country. But uh, my particular lab's interest in this system was in the molecular epidemiology of the virus and if we can use molecular information to infer transmission within the urban environment. So this just shows, again, every year since from 2004 to 2012, we see seasonal increases in the prevalence of West Nile virus in mosquitoes over the course of each transmission season in July, August, and September principally. So it's a predictable phenomenon. And what we've seen over the years is that every year we've looked, the genetic diversity of West Nile virus has increased steadily over the years. So this, this is data from the envelope gene of West Nile virus uh, at the population level. And th these studies were conducted by uh, Luigi Bertolotti at the University of Torino, and uh, Giuseppe Amore and, and Francesco Soruti also at the University of Torino, who have now 
uh, moved on to bigger and better places. But um, what, what they were able to show through our compilation of DNA sequence data is that there's been a steady diversification of this virus within our little study area in Chicago. And it seems like we have fine scale differences in the amount of genetic diversity that we see in this virus, depending on where we collect mosquitoes. So in at least two out of the three years where we've looked, we see higher genetic diversity measured by nucleotide diversity of the envelope gene in mosquitoes collected from residential areas, houses, playgrounds, than in mosquitoes collected from natural areas, parks, cemeteries. We don't know why this is, but it just it, it illustrates that by looking at this very fine scale, you can start to see differences manifesting themselves in the population genetics of these viruses. We've mapped this out, and we see spatial heterogeneity in mosquito infection rates across our very small study site, study area. This is about a 10 by 10 kilometer study area. And you can see certain red areas where West Nile virus transmission is very high, and certain white areas where it's very low. And these differences tend to occur on scales of two to five kilometers apart. And that's interesting because we've done some fairly old school analyses of our viral nucleic acid sequences. And we're able to show that on that same spatial scale, we can detect declines in genetic distance with geographic distance. So this is, a, this is quite an old technique called autocorrelation analysis Autocorrelation autocor indices for DNA analysis. And basically what this says is that viruses collected close to one another in space tend to be more genetically similar to each other than viruses collected far away from each other. And viruses start to get quite different at about four to five kilometers of geographic separation, which is exactly that same spatial scale that we saw. Well, why might this be? This is uh, an interesting study that uh, our former postdoc and now a faculty member at Texas A&M University, Gabe Hamer, conducted, looking at mosquito dispersal. Basically, Gabe used stable isotopes and mass spectroscopy to measure how far mosquitoes disperse from where they're born in the Chicago area. And we, we like to call this our sombrero model of mosquito dispersal. It shows the, the dispersal function over space superimposed on the Chicago landscape. And the, the bottom line here is that mosquitoes don't actually disperse very far. They disperse maybe a few kilometers, which is exactly the spatial scale that we're detecting differences in when we look at our molecular epidemiological data. So we're getting this convergence of genetic information with other epidemiological information to define the scale of transmission of West Nile virus within the suburban Chicago environment. So that's where we've been to date in this very interesting system of West Nile virus in Chicago. And now I, I want to turn it over to uh, Sam Sibley, who's a postdoc in my lab, who's been leading efforts to move our research on West Nile virus into the next generation of deep sequencing. And Sam's going to describe a little bit how we're doing that and what our what, what these new technologies are able to bring to bear to our understanding of West Nile virus. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sam now. Hi, everyone. So West Nile virus isolates that are, that are in existence are generally, are across a full genome, uh, greater than 99% identical. And what that means is that if we want to be able to determine fine-scale changes in the evolution and the epidemiology of West Nile, both locally and nationally, we need to have more than just a, a single gene to move forward with our analyses. So that's where next generation sequencing comes in. Um, what we've done to expand the existing data set that we had that was based primarily on envelope genes is move into next generation sequencing and design uh, overlapping, an overlapping amplicon strategy where we can take five uh, RT-PCR reactions and capture 
full genomic information from West Nile virus isolates. Um, from the existing pool of samples that we had to work with, we had relative quantifications for almost all these samples, that, which are largely mosquito pools, but some bird samples. We started our analyses with the samples that had CT values less than 27. That's where we found sort of the, the sensitivity cutoff for our Amplicon strategy. We drew samples from 2005 to 2012, and we favored pools um, with, with the fewest mosquitoes so that we had uh, the minimum chance of having co-infections within a particular pool. Uh -oh, got it. So for our, for our pipeline, it's a relatively straightforward pipeline for anyone who's used um, Illumina or other next-gen sequencing technologies for Amplicon sequencing. We start with our viral RNA. We move on to a RT-PCR reaction, a one-step reaction. Purify our samples in bulk using gel purification and Zymo technology. Tagment the samples. Go through a standard um, quantification of our tagmented libraries and sizing of the libraries. And then we pull our samples to go on to the MySeq. And what, what we were able to generate with that relatively simple pipeline is 91 uh, genomes from mosquito pools and six near-complete genomes from bird samples. With that data, we, uh, we extracted coding sequences. So West Nile virus has a single open reading frame that's proteolytically cleaved by host and viral proteases. Um, but we can do the analysis on the full open reading frame. Um, we align those open reading frames in just Chicago isolates, and then the Chicago isolates with 601 available se full genome sequences from North America. And many of, the, many of those 601 sequences dropped within the last six months into GenBank. So it's not just us who's taking advantage of these next generation sequencing techniques to expand the epidemiological and uh, evolutionary information that we can gather from um, West Nile virus. We completed evolutionary phylogenetic trees using a maximum likelihood method. And what I'm going to show here are, on the left, is our phylogenetic tree of just Chicago isolates. And the first and probably the most important observation to draw from this tree is the strength of our bootstrap support. So most of you who are listening probably have a sense, but the bootstrap support is how, how confident the, we are as investigators on the groupings. So within a particular clade, how confident we are about the groupings of different sequences together. If we were to do this based on a single gene in West Nile virus, most of these high bootstrap support clades would drop out, and the tree would show very little distinction between the different lineages. But considering full genomes, we see really good distinction and phylogenetic resolution of the different strains. And what I'd like to do for the next couple of minutes is to take advantage of this, this resolution that we see to point out a couple of hallmarks of West Nile virus evolution and epidemiology. So the first hallmark, the first hallmark that I'll talk about is that there's evidence for the emergence and then the, the subsidence of unique lineages. And this is an observation that's been made by us and also by other groups who have done a lot of sequencing, particularly groups in Texas. Um, moving forward to look at this lower clade, we see that in 2010, nine of the 16 full genome sequences we generated group into a single, tight, monophyletic, and confidently grouped clade. And what's important to note here is that there aren't other sequences from other years that branch off. We have data from 2011 and 2012, and there's no shared sequences there. So this is truly a unique set of viral sequences that emerged in this year that we wouldn't have necessarily been able to see had it not been for our ability to look at whole genomes. And when we expand to, uh, if we take 
and add in the phylogeny that's generated from from all the sequence. So, so now this is a subsampling of the meters long phylogeny that you generate from a uh, from 700 sequences. This clade is still monophyletic, and primarily we see two other Chicago isolates as outgroups to this clade. So this is one that that arose and has subsequently subsided. So the next hallmark that I'd like to point out, which is sort of the, the, the most prominent feature in the epidemiology and evolution of West Nile virus, is the fact that there's evidence for significant mixing of West Nile genotypes across North America. And what, what you'll see in the literature is this is referred to as a panmictic distribution of West Nile virus. Um, Focusing specifically on a clade up here, it's the largest clade of sequences that we generated. And we see representatives uh, within this clade that span from 2005 all the way to 2012. Um, and that could indicate that there's some persistence of the same lineage across years within Chicago. So certainly there is. But also, it's likely that some of these sequences arrive from reintroduction from other parts of the US. And this be, the likelihood of this increases when you look at these sequences among the seven, within the, set, the phylogeny generated from the 700 sequences. What we have here is the red dots on the left still show the high bootstrap support of this clade within the 700 sequence phylogeny. And to the right, the, the orange dots show our sequences, their positions within this phylogeny. And what we see is there's multiple representatives that share a same lineage outside of North America, which really emphasizes this panmictic or broadly distributed distribution of lineages. So, now what I'd like to do is sort of shift the focus and finish the presentation with a discussion of some of the strengths and challenges of using next-gen sequencing for veterinary molecular epidemiology. And more broadly, just for the strengths and challenges of using these techniques for microbial sequencing. So in, in our study, we in the past, we've used a lot of unbiased methods. And by unbiased, I mean methods that are based primarily on random hexamers or very generic primers. Um, and th some of the strengths of these methods are we can detect viruses or pathogens that we don't know are present in the sample a priori. And you can detect multiple microbes, these co-infections that, that Tony mentioned. But it also brings up the challenges that in a lot of our samples, we have limited template, which really challenge the method. And in particular, in these samples with limited template, the, the growing awareness of reagent and laboratory contamination becomes really, really important. Um, as, as, your, as your starting target material decreases, the impact of contamination from reagents and other sources in the laboratory become particularly important. And this is something that's emphasized in 16S microbial studies and in some laboratory systems such as cell culture, where there may be viruses that are present in an investigator's cell culture system that they never knew about because they never looked. But those are the kinds of things that are going to pop up. Uh, next, uh, in sort of tandem strengths, are that we see these co-infections, and we can see and look into the viral quasi-species. Um, a limit to that, though, in terms of epidemiological investigations is that it, haplotype assembly is still a statistical process. So piecing together the individual short reads into a competent single representative of a viral genome or particular haplotype, this, the current methods are still, it's still challenging to generate these complete haplotypes. And also, a strength is we can generate full genomes. And in particular, I think of a study that we've done with ronaviruses, which are a large DNA virus that are decimating amphibian populations across the world. Uh, these viruses are 
250 kilobases, which would be a nightmare to try to, try to generate full genome, the full genomes necessary to do proper epidemiology on these infections. But with that said, the, the hallmark for distinguishing a lot of these strains is through variable numbers of tandem repeats, or VNTRs. And next-gen sequencing still doesn't do a great job of distinguishing these VNTR regions. And finally, as an overall statement, we have, with next-gen sequencing, we can get a real comprehensive set of genetic data to do our epidemiological and evolutionary analyses with. But we already have a complex set of epidemiological data, background data, such as um, dates and times of infections, species that are infected, and so on, host genetics, all, the, all these kinds of factors, and merging all the data we get from NextGen with all the data that's currently available in epidemiological models is very challenging. So, in conclusion, we've seen that next generation sequencing can be highly efficient for, for measuring and detecting genetic variation for veterinary pathogens. And it can even identify, in many cases, co-infections that we might not have expected and reveal new transmission pathways. Um, us and several other groups around the world are beginning to use these techniques in a real way for veterinary molecular epidemiology. And this highlights the, the great strength of next-gen sequencing, but also introduces a lot of challenges that the community will have to solve in the coming, coming uh, months and years. So with that, we have acknowledgments. And I'll let Tony do the acknowledgments. <laughs> I'm not going to read through the acknowledgments of the interest in time, uh, in the interest of time. But um, I guess we'll, we'll end the talk there, and we can open it up to any questions for the time we have remaining. OK. I, Tony, I, I came up, uh, actually, Tony and Sam, I came up with quite a few questions. And it, it might be coming from my, my ignorance on, on mosquitoes, for example, on the West Nile. But how, how do the, the mosquitoes get infected with West Nile? Because every year, it seems like the mosquitoes would die, right? And, and so they would have to, it would be the larva that would show up again. And so at that point, you would see a lot of variation within the, uh, the virus. And, and I think that can explain that. But you said that it was actually conserved. So does it, does it keep it throughout the year or throughout the winter? So that, that's a great question. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to figure out. So we're hoping we're going to, there's a debate. Um, can we, does West Nile come into cities like Chicago every year in Migratory, migratory birds, or does it persist in mosquitoes that hang out underground, for example, over the winter? And the, the answer is probably both. But um, we would like to be able to see if we can use our molecular data to detect which lineages are persisting in underground mosquitoes and which ones are coming in across the, uh, you know, from other areas due to migrations of birds. And I think even with full West Nile genome sequences, it's still going to be hard because it's such a stable virus in many ways. Its evolutionary rate is so slow that even with the most advanced technologies and the most complete genome sequences, the phylogenetic trees still are fairly poor resolution. So I don't know, despite the best technologies, if we'll be able to answer that question. Okay, I have another question. Actually, one is coming from uh, um, Mohammed, and he's asking um, how to prepare the sample prep for next generation sequencing. But I'm going to add to that because it seems like so. Depending on the virus you are that you are studying, at that point you're doing shotgun metagenomics or amplicon approaches. I saw that you're doing multiple ones. Would you expand on how you choose one versus the other? Yeah, so so it's a, it's a good question, and it's. All I can say is it's in a case-by-case -case basis. So it depends on the goal of the study. Um, for example, if we want to sequence a lot of West Nile virus genomes very rapidly, so that the data that Sam talked about were generated in a matter of weeks, which is very fast, we, we, we would choose an amplicon-based strategy because we can uh, process many samples in parallel. If we were uh, 
you know, interested more broadly in co-infections, we may choose another strategy. But unfortunately, and, and that is one of the limitations, there is no single answer to that question. It depends on the goal of the study. It depends on the budget. It depends on the type of virus and the type of sample. And uh, I, I, you know, despite how, how alluring these next generation sequencing technologies are, I think they're, they're more complicated in terms of how you choose to prepare your samples and, and generate what goes on to the next generation sequencing machine. So uh, unfortunately, Mohammed, I'm not able to answer your question directly because it, 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 it's a different answer for every single study that you do. Okay. I, I had another question. Um, it, so you talked about the GB virus C. I actually didn't know anything about this, but can you tell us of the mode of infection of the GB virus C? Because it seems like as it counter uh, Ebola, it would only try to keep the host to live longer to actually maybe spread more? I, I don't know. That's one of my questions. Yeah, all I can say about that, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to say too much because I, I want to, you know, defer to the expertise of people who have been studying this virus for longer, is that it's, it's a very common human virus that seems to persist in people around the world at high titer without causing clinical disease, and it may have subtle immune effects to prolong its own persistence, and, and those immune effects may have the consequence of interacting with other viruses. Um, I'm using a lot of may and should and possibly because we really don't know much about it. The mode of transmission is almost certainly through, through direct contact, sexual, other types of close contact. But it's just sort of a, a, a kind of like a background virus that many people around the world have. And um, it's been difficult to study because there, ha there haven't been animal models for, for the virus. So that's something people are, are generally interested in. But um, yeah. I, it, 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 at this point, I would say these are intriguing epidemiological observations that hopefully will be elucidated in, in the near future. Okay. Well, I'll ask one more question uh, from uh, Fabian. It says, uh, will will be possible to develop the real-time method for monitoring the diversity of such type of disease for monitoring and de developing new control strategies? Another good question, I, I, say I might have to defer to you, because I think one thing, one, one major limitation I didn't talk about with deep sequencing technologies right now is that they are very far from being field deployable. So we work in remote parts of the, the world and, remote, and you know, parts of the country, even, even the suburbs of Chicago, you know, as far from, from, is very far from my lab. So we're always faced with the limitations of transporting and storing samples. It would be awfully nice to have these technologies able to be deployed widely, uh, but they're not there yet. So I think eventually that will happen, but it's not clear exactly what the technology will be that can serve that purpose or uh, what types of on-site laboratory capabilities one would have to have. So I think we're, we're actually farther from that goal than, than I, I would wish that we are. Oh, I thought you had your mice strapped up to your car, but oh, that's, <laughs> they're awfully delicate. I, I, I can that, that much I know. So uh, I, I think that that's that's more uh, in the realm of science fiction right now than science reality. <laughs> so thank you so much. Well, you're, um, you're very welcome.